All right, so I want to think about a canonical problem in the social sciences, which is to model the relationship between some set of measurable covariates, which I'm going to fix and call x1 through xk, and then some outcome of interest, y. The focus of our paper is on this question of how we should evaluate how well a given model does in prediction. Now, the reason why this is challenging is because the same objective level of predictive accuracy can mean very different things in different problems. So let's be more concrete about this. Let's say you have a model, and this model predicts correctly in 60% of your test instances. Now, is that a good outcome? Is that a bad outcome? The answer to that question depends a lot on the problem that you're facing. Now, if you've achieved that level of predictive accuracy, predicting the location of a planet tomorrow, okay, suitably discretized, based off of a rich set of physical measurements, 60% is pretty poor. We expect to be able to get attain something much closer to perfect prediction in this problem. Now, take the same level of predictive accuracy, 60%, and imagine that you've now obtained this predicting whether the S&P 500 goes up or down tomorrow. Now, suddenly, 60% is really phenomenal. Now, this example illustrates two things. So first, the predictive limits differ significantly across different problems. Right? In this first problem, given your feature set, we expect to be able to predict the outcome near perfectly. In the second problem, conditioning on the features that we have available to us, we can't expect to attain perfect prediction. Right. Second, in order to even understand what something like 60% accuracy actually means, we need to compare it not against perfect prediction, but against some notion of best achievable accuracy that is tailored to your problem and to the feature set that you have available. Right. But how do we come up with some, such a notion of best achievable accuracy? The proposed approach in our project is to use machine learning to construct such a benchmark. And I want to mention also that this is a uh, an approach that's being proposed in some very nice concurrent work by Alex Pizikovic, who gave a talk yesterday, and his co-author, Jeff Nager. So what I'm going to show you today is I'm going to identify a domain in which the space of predictive models can actually be searched to optimality. And what that's going to mean is that we don't have to worry about which machine learning algorithm we use in order to construct this benchmark. There's actually going to be a very natural best algorithm. Then we can use that algorithm to evaluate what the best attainable level of predictive accuracy is in that problem. And we can compare the performance of existing theories against this best machine learning benchmark. Right, so now you might wonder, what is this domain in which we can actually search the space of predictive models to optimality? What we consider is human generation of randomness. So if you're not familiar with this topic, it's a topic that's been studied for a very long time in psychology and in behavioral economics. The reason why people care about it is because it has applications to real problems with uh, real decisions and real stakes. So for example, human perception of portfolio returns, also the sequential decisions that are made by experts like judges and loan officers. So a stylized fact in this domain is that people generate negatively autocorrelated strings. So if you have a loan that you want approved, it's best if the loan officer sees your loan after a sequence of loans that he has rejected. And psychologically, he thinks it's about time for a good loan to appear. Right now, starting from Kahneman and Tversky in 1972, there's been extensive evidence of such misperceptions of randomness. Now, a common experimental framework for looking at this kind of misperception is to have humans generate random sequences. We're going to follow in this tradition today. We're going to try to predict human-generated IID coin flips. So in a little bit more detail, what we did is we went on Mechanical Turk, and we asked a large number of subjects to generate random sequences as if they were flipping a fair coin multiple times. So each subject generated 50 strings of length 8. Altogether, we have about 22,000 total human-generated strings. A few stylized facts about these human-generated strings. So first, the human-generated distribution over these eight length binary strings is inconsistent with what we would expect under a true Bernoulli process. Now, moreover, the way in which this, this uh, distribution deviates from what we would expect under the true Bernoulli process is consistent with comparative references in the literature. So I'll be a little bit more detailed about what I mean by that. So here, take a look at the top left figure. Okay. The x-axis here is the number of heads in the string. The y-axis is the fraction of strings that contained that total number of heads. The purple bars here correspond to our experimental data set, and the yellow bars correspond to what we would expect to see under a Bernoulli process. So what you see is that, in fact, 
the human subjects are generating too many strings with a balanced number of heads, so four heads, four tails. On the top right, we have the same figure, but now the purple bars are a previous data set from the literature. So you see that qualitatively, the, two, the comparison is very similar. Now, on the bottom left, the x-axis is the run length, and the y-axis is the fraction of runs that are of that given length. Again, the purple bars are our data, and the yellow bars are what we would expect to see under a Bernoulli process. So what you see here is that the, the runs that are generated by humans are too short in expectation. And so they're generating too few strings that contain, for example, a long sequence of heads. And again, the bottom left, uh, sorry, the bottom right is now the comparative reference, and qualitatively, they're very similar. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I just can't hear you a little bit louder. Right, so here we're aggregating. We're taking a look at the whole set of strings, of 22,000 strings that have been generated. Maybe we could talk offline, I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right, so these type facts have been known in the literature for quite a while, and in behavioral economics, there have been several influential models that have been written down to capture this phenomenon. So one model proposed in Rabin 2002 takes the simple approach of assuming that the decision maker is generating flips by drawing from an urn. Initially, this urn contains an equal number of heads balls and tails balls, but the key is that he's drawing from this urn without replacement. So what that means is that after drawing a heads flip, the next flip is less likely to be heads. And there is another parameter here which determines the probability that the urn is refreshed every period, where refreshed simply means that it's returned to its initial composition of an equal number of heads and tails. And so this model produces negatively autocorrelated strings. <coughs> okay, Rabin and Vianis is a later model that captures similar ideas. It uses a, a richer parametric form. So here there's two free parameters, alpha and delta, and they control the effect of past flips on the current flip. Okay, delta here is a decay factor, so it means that if the last flip was heads, that has a stronger impact of the probability of the current flip being heads than, say, a flip three, uh, three flips ago. So we can use these models to predict the strings, and I'm going to focus your attention on two prediction tasks in particular. So we call the first prediction task continuation. And how this works is I give the algorithm the initial seven flips that have been generated by the human subject, and I ask the algorithm to predict the final flip. So here, a prediction rule is going to be any function from seven length binary strings into a probability that the final flip is heads. Given a test set of strings, I'm going to measure error using mean squared error. So here, this is an indicator function for whether the final flip was indeed heads, and then we have the predicted probability that the final flip was heads, given the first seven flips in the string. Okay, now, one approach we can always use is to simply naively guess one half for every instance, and this is going to guarantee us a mean squared error of one fourth. A second prediction task we consider is something we call a classification. So now the exercise is, let me give the algorithm a large set of strings. Half of these strings were generated by human subjects, and half of these strings were generated by a true Bernoulli process. Can the algorithm distinguish the human-generated strings from the Bernoulli strings? And now a classification rule is going to be a function from eight-length binary sequences into a probability that the source was human. I'm again going to use mean squared error to evaluate prediction error. So we have here an indicator function for whether the source of the string was in fact human and the predicted probability that the source was human given the eight length string. Again, naively guessing one half is going to yield a mean squared error of one fourth in this problem. Okay, 
I, I assume this crowd is familiar with cross-validation, but just, just briefly, what we do is we randomly split the data into 10 equally sized folds. We train the free parameters on nine of the folds, predict on the 10th the fold, and average across the choices of test folds. Okay, so all the errors I'll give you in this talk are all going to be tenfold cross-validated. As mentioned previously, this naive approach guarantees a mean squared error of one-fourth, and now we can ask, how do the behavioral models do in comparison with this benchmark, this naive benchmark? So here are the prediction errors. Okay. The first observation to make from this table is that these models are predictive. So they're reducing prediction error based off of what we would get from random guessing. Right. And in the Raven and Viannis case, this improvement is statistically significant. But even in the very best case, we're reducing prediction error by 0.0012. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know what that means. So what we really want is we want a benchmark against which to evaluate these prediction errors so we can get a sense of whether 0.0012 is something significant. And how are we going to construct such a benchmark? We're going to use a, a process, a procedure we call a table lookup. Right, so a special feature of this domain is that the feature space is actually very small. So for the continuation task, we have a feature set that contains all binary strings of length seven. So there's two to the seven possible features, uh, feature vectors. And for the classification task, we have two to the eight. Given 22,000 strings, we can actually simply estimate the human generation, the human generated distribution over this feature space. And we can use that distribution for prediction. So natural prediction rules for continuation and classification are the following. So for continuation, if you give me the first seven flips that the subject has generated, I can simply go into the training data and look at the frequency with which these seven flips were followed by heads. Right? And I predict that frequency. Okay, similar for classification, if you give me an eight length string, I can look at the frequency in the training data with which this string was produced and compare that with the predicted Bernoulli probability. Now, again, given enough data, these approaches will approximate the best possible prediction error in these domains to arbitrary accuracy. Okay, again, I'll emphasize this is conditioning on initial flips only, which is also the feature set that is used by these behavioral models. So here I have the numbers that I showed you previously. And here's how table lookup does. So first comment, the table lookup errors are far from zero. And what that means is that this benchmark is, is really non-trivially different from using zero as a benchmark, right? So comparing, let's say, 0 0.2492 against zero is a very different thing from comparing it against what we can actually attain in this problem, which is 0 0.2439. So we do, in fact, need benchmarks for such problems. And the second thing we can learn from this is well, we can ask the question of what fraction of the attainable achievement in the problem is, in fact, attained by the behavioral models? So to provide one answer to this, we can normalize the naive baseline to zero and the table lookup prediction error to one, again, interpreting this as really the predictive limit of the problem. And then what we see is that these existing models achieve up to 15% of the achievable improvement in the prediction error. All right. I'll call that completeness from now on. So I want to spend the rest of this talk talking about some questions that are related to this concept of completeness and, and benchmarks. So the first question I'm going to ask is, what are the limitations of these existing behavioral models? So why aren't they performing as well as table lookup? Right. The second question I'll ask is, well, this table lookup method is highly parameterized. Right. So how robust is it going to be to small changes in the test environment, in the training environment? The third question, so far everything I've shown you is experimental data. And often we care about actually empirical real world data. Are there settings outside of the lab in which we can use an approach like table lookup? Okay, and then finally, why does table lookup not achieve perfect prediction? I've already alluded to this a bit, but really this is a statement about the power of the feature set, and I'll, I'll get back to this at the end. Okay, so why aren't these existing models 
performing as well as table lookup, there's two distinct possibilities for what's going on. The first possibility is that there are features of the initial flips that table lookup is using for prediction, but that the behavioral models aren't capturing. So it's feature set is in, it's incomplete. Another distinct possibility is that the behavioral models are actually using the right features of initial flips. They're just not combining them as well as for prediction. So how do we distinguish between these two possibilities? What we do is we define a set of basic features of the strings that reflect the qualitative insights of the behavioral model. So these are all going to be interpretable features that are based in the literature. Okay, and then we use standard machine learning algorithms to combine these basic features for prediction. And we compare the prediction of these machine learning algorithms, again, trained on the small set of interpretable features relative to the existing models and to table lookup. So what are these features? So again, these are based on the literature. One example feature is the proportion of alternations in the string. Another is the total number of runs of a given length. Okay, we have the length of the longest run at the beginning of the string, length of the longest run at the end of the string, and the total number of heads in the string. We include also their pairwise interactions. And we use some standard machine learning algorithms, so lasso regression, decision trees, to construct prediction rules based off of these features. Now, a few comments, compared to table lookup, these approaches are much more scalable. And then, again, they have the key feature that they're only going to use things that we can interpret. All right, so here I've just put into a figure the completeness measure that I showed you previously. So here, interpret zero as the naive baseline, what we would get by random guessing, and interpret the one as the table lookup error. I showed you previously that the existing models achieved up to 15% of the achievable reduction in predictive error. Now, how do these scalable machine learning algorithms do? Okay, that's where they get us. So the scalable machine learning algorithms, again, built on essentially the same kinds of features that the behavioral models are using, uh, approximates the, improve, uh, the prediction performance of table lookup. All right. So, We've limited the feature set, but it's still a relatively large number of parameters compared to the existing models. We might now wonder, how well can we predict when we constrain these machine learning algorithms to use only a small number of features comparable to the existing models? So what we do is we retrain these algorithms, now subject to the constraint that the models can use no more than first we take two features and then we take five features. So here's what I showed you a moment ago. Here's what we can get with a two-parameter model, again, trained using machine learning. And here's what we can get with five parameters. So even these small parameters uh, models are yielding improvements on top of the existing behavioral models. And actually, each of these represents an alternative benchmark, right? So if you want to compare the existing models not against the full table lookup, you can compare it against the performance of the scalable machine learning algorithm or even one of these constrained algorithms. OK. So this exercise is a little bit unfair for the following reason. Right? We know that in a given environment, if we have sufficient training data, we don't really worry about the complexity of the model, right? So if overfitting is not an issue, we want to go with the most complex model. Certainly, that will predict well in the given domain. But the authors of these behavioral models aren't trying to predict data in any specific domain. What they want is a model that it's actually going to port across many different domains. Right? So the idea is that if you estimate the free parameters of your model on one given setting, you can actually take those parameter estimates and use them for prediction in a different setting. Right? Table lookup, because it is so flexible, it does something that's a little bit dangerous. So it not only learns the general features of human misperception that we think occur across different settings, but it also learns any features of human misperception that are idiosyncratic to generation of coin flips of length eight. So one such idiosyncratic feature is that, in fact, 57% of strings generated by humans begin with heads. So if you want to classify human-generated strings versus Bernoulli strings, looking at whether the first flip is heads is actually already a very good predictor. But that's pretty special to coin flips. The table lookup obviously uses this. The behavioral models don't. So what we do to test the robustness of the table lookup predictor is we train models on the original data set. And then we change the testing environment slightly. 
Okay, so we, we get new strengths that are generated under a slightly different framing. And we see how well the table lookup approach does relative to these existing behavioral models. So the new framings are the following. So first we change the alphabet from which these strings are drawn, sorry, from which the, uh, the flips are drawn. And then we also change the length of the string. So we collect strings of length 15. And we predict not the eighth flip, but we, we look at flips 2 through 9, 3 through 10, and so forth. And what we find is that in these new environments, the completeness measure remains relatively stable, okay, despite the transfer nature of these prediction tasks. So we see that with the new alphabet, the existing models achieve, again, roughly, now it's about 10% of the achievable improvement. And in the 15 length string case, we're achieving about 20% of the attainable improvement. Yeah? Should I interpret the table lookup? There are complicated things that are in the data. Mm -hmm. Of what's going on in the table lookup. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But they're there, and, and, and they're there not only in the flippings, uh, mm -hmm. but they're there in, in the next set of things that you do. That's right, right. So it appears that table lookup is picking up on complex features beyond the existing models that Something exist in these many domains. That we don't understand why. Right, right. I see two heads and then I, some, some fractions. Right, right. That's what I'm suggesting is that it seems to be constant. Yeah, okay. okay. I do want to point out that here the difference in the framing is relatively minor, right? So we're not we're not porting this across a very large, yeah, difference in domain. Okay. Okay. So so far everything has been for lab data. Now I want to show you that this approach actually also works with field data. So what we did is we went and found data that represented an instantiation of the same problem, but in environments in which people are making real decisions with real stakes. The first is baseball umpire calls. And so I don't know how much you know about baseball. I didn't know very much about it before this paper. But an important role of umpires is to judge whether pitches are strikes or calls when the batter does not, uh, does not swing at the ball. And so we have sequential decisions made by these umpires as to whether to call strikes or balls. The second setting we look at is rock, paper, scissors tournaments. And here, individuals are making sequential decisions as to whether to throw a rock, paper, or scissors. And again, in these settings, we can test these existing models. And again, we can construct a lookup table to construct a benchmark against which to evaluate the predictive performance of the existing models. Scott, do I have about five minutes left? Is that the? I don't have a, a clock. Oh, great. OK, so I'll slow down a bit. All right, so in a little bit more detail, so this first setting, okay, there is a rectangular prism over home base, where if the ball flies through this prism and the batter does not swing, you should call the ball a strike, and otherwise you should call the ball a ball, sorry, the pitch a ball. Okay, this is up to the judgment of the umpire. We were given a large data set of umpire calls, and what we did is we extracted from this data set sequences of six consecutive calls made by an umpire. So in this new setting, we can look at the same tasks of continuation and classification. What they look like now is the following. So for continuation, we ask, if I tell you the first five calls that the umpire made, so ball strike, strike, ball strike, can you predict the next call that is made by this umpire? And our prediction rule here is going to be a function from these five length uh, binary sequences again into a probability. For classification, we can ask, if I give you a set of strings, and half of these strings are, in fact, umpire sequences of umpire calls, and half of these strings were generated under an independent process, can you separate the umpire calls from the independently generated sequences? So a brief comment, in the first continuation task, we have to modify the naive prediction rule slightly because the base rate of strikes and balls are not the same. Right? But essentially what we can do is we can predict the unconditional mean uh, in the final flip. And in the classification task, the naive rule remains the same. We simply predict one half for every single string. So this is what we find in the setting. So relative to how well table lookup does at predicting subsequent umpire calls or classifying the strings, the existing behavioral models achieve about 20% of the achievable improvement. Okay. This is very similar to what I had shown you before with the experimental data. 
the second setting is rock, paper, scissors. So in 2007, there was this, this uh, reasonably popular Facebook app in which different Facebook uh, users played games of rock, paper, scissors against one another. So each of these games lasted until one of the players had won two of the matches. And what we did is we took all games that lasted at least six throws, and we took the initial sequence of six throws. So we have 29,000 such strings. <coughs> Again, in the setting, we can look at the prediction of Rabin and Vianis, and we can also look at the prediction of table lookup and, and compare them. So I'll, just, I'll leave this up for a second. So this is just the, the version of the continuation in the classification task modified for this domain. It's a little bit different because now we're, pre we're predicting a ternary outcome as opposed to a binary outcome, but it's, it's essentially everything else is the same. We have a prediction rule that maps five length ternary strings into a probability vector for the final output. Okay, and for continuation, it's exactly the same. We have strings of rock, paper, scissor throws, and we have strings generated under an independent process. And this is what we find for the setting. So relative to the improvement of table lookup, we find that the existing models achieve, here it's about 10% at most of the achievable improvement. So a few takeaways from the setting. First, the completest measures seem to be relatively stable across these different instantiations of the problem, despite wide differences in the domains. And what do I mean by wide differences? Well, the experimental setting was one of pure generation. So we literally went to these subjects and we asked them, pretend like you're flipping a coin and give us strings that are generated like that. The baseball umpire call setting is, is different because, in fact, these guys are doing something more sophisticated. They're doing some sort of inference. Right? They observe the pitch, they observe the, uh, where the ball goes, and they report outcomes. And the rock, paper, scissors setting is still different because, in fact, there is something strategic going on here. Okay, these players are behaving in a strategic environment. They're not purely generating random sequences. And so it was, it was interesting to us that despite these differences, the completeness measure was between this interval of 6 to 21% in all of these problems. But there is still variation across the completeness measures, and that variation is also interesting. So what we find is that Rabin and Vianis captures less of the predictable structure in this rock, paper, scissor setting than in the umpire setting. So in the rock, paper, scissor setting, we're achieving 6 to 11% uh, sorry, in the rock paper scissors setting, the existing models are achieving 6 to 11 percent of the achievable improvement, and in the umpire setting, they're achieving 17 to 21 percent of the achievable improvement. And I want to emphasize that that's not something we could have told purely from the prediction errors themselves. So if you look at these two tables, if you ignore the table lookup row, the quantitative improvement in prediction error is actually fairly similar across these two domains. So if we look at, for example, classification, the Rabin and Vianis model improved prediction error from 0.25 to 0.2489. And if we look at the second domain, we improved prediction error from 0.25 to 0.2491. So those improvements look relatively similar. Okay, to make a statement comparing the two domains and to say that we've done better in one of these problems than in the other, we need to know what the benchmark is. And we find that the benchmark is higher in the first problem than in the second problem. Right, so that's why we're achieving more of the achievable improvement in this first problem than in the second problem. OK, so just a few concluding remarks. Table lookup is itself not predicting perfectly. And why is that? Okay, now, that's really a statement about the feature set that we're using, which in this talk throughout has been just the initial flips generated by the subject. So as another perspective on this, we could continue to add features. We could still use table lookup in those domains. We need more data. Um, conditional on sufficient data, the, the uh, performance of table lookup is going to improve as we add in new features. And just as one thought experiment, let's say we begin with some feature set X. Okay, take this for example to be initial flips. What table lookup does is it learns for each feature vector in X, it learns the, the probability, the frequency with which that string yields an outcome of heads. Let's consider now addition of some new feature, for example, the subject's age. Now what table lookup is going to do is it's going to learn a probability of heads for each initial flip uh, of length seven and also for the subject age, right? So now we have this, this richer feature vector. Naturally, that's going to perform better 
But then reflecting back to what we did originally with, with the feature set x, the limitation here can be understood as exactly the limitation that arises by averaging over all of these unmeasured features. And given this perspective, an interesting question becomes, how does the benchmark, so the table lookup performance, improve as we consider, as we add in more features? And we can also do comparative exercises. So you have one feature set x and another feature set x prime. Here, the benchmark can be interpreted as quantifying the power of these different feature sets. So we can actually do comparisons like that. Right. Another question is, what features might represent substantial improvements in prediction error? And so things that we didn't consider in this paper, but which might yield large improvements in prediction include things like subject's IDs, again, the subject's age and education level, or maybe response times, uh, features like that. Okay, now just to conclude, the basic point made today is that if you want to evaluate the predictive accuracy of the theory, you shouldn't be comparing it against perfect prediction. Rather, you should be comparing it against the best achievable level of prediction in your problem given your feature set. And what we've proposed is that methods in machine learning might provide a practical way to generate useful benchmarks for this exercise. We've argued that when feasible, table lookup is a good benchmark. When table lookup is not feasible, scalable machine learning algorithms may nevertheless serve as surrogate benchmarks for this exercise. This is also the approach that's taken in Alex's paper. Then why would we want, if the theory does this 20% advance or something, uh -huh. Uh-huh. Why do we need the theory at all? Why do we need the theories? Let's just have the machine learning and forget about the, the, the are trying to understand with a model of people's brains. Uh-huh. Isn't that a, also a logical so that's certainly a perspective. It's, it's, not, it's not my perspective, and I'll give you several reasons why. Uh, so one is that, you know, we're researchers, we care about understanding. So prediction is an important goal, but understanding is, is also an important goal. Um, another is that there are certain exercises that we can't conduct using the machine learning algorithm. So for example, in economics, we care a lot about things like comparative statics. Uh, this is not something that's feasible using a black box machine learning algorithm. Um, and the final reason I'll give you is this discussion we were having previously about portability. Right, so there is still this feeling that these simple interpretable behavioral models may port better across con contexts that are very different as compared to table lookup. I can have a, a, a machine learning in all your contents. Oh, sure, each yeah. Learning, each Okay, so I, I agree with that, but then, right, refer back to one and two, yeah. Can you remind us what are the typical so-called existing models? What are machine learning tools that are used in learning? Sorry, which, what do I mean by machine learning here? Yeah, what do you mean by machine learning? Yeah, so in this talk, what I... What do I mean by existing models? Okay, good. Okay, so in this talk, machine learning meant table lookup. Okay, but more generally, it might mean any sort of a theoretical prediction rule that is built on some set of features. Okay, then you could, through lasso regression or decision trees or neural nets or any, any method of your preferred take. What do you mean by existing models? Yeah. But in your exercise, you're saying machine learning achieves certain percentage. That's correspond to table lookup, correspond to the improvements was brought by some. So I think you're referring to the exercise in which I compared the output of, of lasso and decision trees as compared to table lookup. Right, so table lookup here represents the, the best possible prediction rule. Um, it's the most black box of all these algorithms. We really have no idea what, what it's doing. Yeah. Right, exactly. The smaller bar is the existing models. And what I mean by existing models here is a model that an economic theorist has written down. Uh, you can think of it as a parametric model with a small number of parameters. Typically, economic theorists think of these as, instead of as narratives, these are stories, they have some sort of interpretation, um, they help you understand what's going on. So for example, the, the urn story, right? We're drawing from an urn without replacement, that's, that's a story we can understand. As compared to table lookup, this is very black box. Okay. All right, and then we illustrated this approach on the problem of predicting human generation of random sequences, and we found that in this domain, the existing interpretable models achieved roughly 15% of the predictive performance achieved by table lookup. And moreover, this completeness measure was roughly robust across many different settings. Okay. Yeah. So I have a question about yeah. the table lookup as a benchmark for the better method, because I think this depends on you have enough data and also you ignore the inner structure of your data. For example, if we also use the human generated from the sequence, if we generate the n child sequence for 111, so we cannot guide enough sample for possible configuration. If we also we can, so this time the table lookup is not going to be 
Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So our point here is not to say that table lookup is the best possible thing. We actually, we engineered the domain so that table lookup is feasible in this problem and represents the best uh, potential predictive accuracy. More generally, we'll have to rely on things like scalable machine learning algorithms or uh, other approaches given data limitations and just given the complexity of the problem. Okay. Do we have? Okay. And so you tell it you have an oracle that knows what the counts are for every single combination of the first time. Yes, exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is it's not the best you can do, it's better than the best you can do, right? How can you do better than the best you can do? Well but it's but it's better than anyone could ever possibly do, right? It's it's a, it's a strict upper bound for what you could possibly do with the information at hand because you're comparing to an oracle that has more than the information. At hand. Oh but but it, these are still uh, out of sample predictions. Well, just given enough training data, then you would expect that the out of sample error is approximates the best you could do. So, so we're not cheating. We're not using the, the test data to predict. We're still using. Yes. Yeah, so, right. So the approach is we're, we're constructing these counts based off of a large set of training data. And then we're testing on out of sample data, but drawn from the same distribution. So then given enough training data, we're approximating the best possible prediction error. But these are still out of sample. Prediction errors. So then it's not the best possible. It's OK, so, I, so you want to argue that we could have used an in sample prediction error as the best possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. OK, no, so I like this point. So there's two potential best possible here. So one is the best possible using out of sample testing. Another is best possible in the sense of I've given you the test data and uh, predict the test data, right? So, so certainly in sample prediction error would have been another. But we're going to, uh, the, the two are going to be very close. In, in this so, then, so all of the errors you reported are cross-validated? Yes. Mm -hmm. And below them you reported a standard error estimate? That's right. Mm -hmm. How did you estimate the standard error? So that's the, uh, the standard error across the different folds. So the prediction errors, the variance of the prediction errors across the different test sets. Is that about estimate? It's, it's about estimate or it has uh, some problems, but it's the one that's uh, canonically used in So one more time, it's using the output. Exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. That's right. So each of those is a row. Sure. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So both the machine learning approaches and also the existing models, they're all using. Some compression of the of the rows, yeah, to predict. <laughs> yeah, so this is maybe a cross-discipline uh, argument. To, right, so what does interpretable even mean? Uh, so for economic theorists, this is considered. <laughs> sure, I yeah, I, I'll be agnostic about that. I mean, this is interpretable. Uh, maybe lasso is also interpretable. It's, it gets a little fuzzy into, as to what that exactly means. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you for the very lively discussion.